Good morning, everyone. Have you ever done one of those games on social media or elsewhere where you ask folks to post one word that describes you? I've never done it, but I always wonder who would people say that I am? And would they be right? If you've ever done something like this, who did people say that you were and were they right? Today, Jesus asks us to consider the same question about him. Now, last week, I asked us to look at our own identity, but this week, I want to look at who Jesus is because the two are intrinsically linked. Father Richard War says, when you get your who am I question right, all of your what should I do questions tend to take care of themselves. For Christians, who am I begins with who Jesus is. And so I ask us today, who do we say that Jesus is? Now, our scripture passage today comes not long after Jesus' encounter with the scribes and Pharisees over tradition that we looked at last week. But there's one more encounter that he has with them before our passage today. At the beginning of Matthew 16, the scribes and Pharisees come to Jesus again, and they ask for a sign from heaven. That is, they want him to prove who he is with some miracle. He refuses and tells them the only sign they will get will be the sign of Jonah, which is an allusion to his death and resurrection. He knows that they don't really know who he is, nor would they accept it. Jesus then warns his disciples not to follow suit. He tells them to beware the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the disciples respond by asking him if he's talking about bread. They literally say in chapter 16, verse 6, Is it because we didn't bring any bread? I love this because the disciples didn't always get it either. I think it's important to note that Jesus isn't condemning the Pharisees and Sadducees for not knowing everything or for doubting, but for thinking that they did know everything. Jesus forgives Peter's denial and embraces Thomas's doubt. The same way last week I mentioned that Jesus never condemned sinners, just those who thought they had no sin. I think Jesus was more concerned with the folks who thought they knew everything about God than those who didn't. Although, that certainly doesn't mean he didn't get exasperated with them sometimes. I love Jesus' response in uh, chapter 16, verse 11, where he says, How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Even Jesus got frustrated with his people sometimes. So it's not long after this encounter that Matthew then describes Jesus questioning the disciples about who others say he is and who they say he is. Jesus begins by asking his followers who others say he is. And they answer, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah who was expected to return at some point, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. As we see throughout the Gospels, people had varying expectations of who the Messiah would be. Some even thought he would be a political revolutionary who conquered the Romans, so Jesus certainly didn't fit their expectations. Little did they know he would conquer something even greater. So this gave me pause to wonder, how do we do the same thing today? Often we view Jesus through the lens of Luther or Calvin or Bart or Billy Graham or fill in the blank. I also wonder if we view who Jesus is through our cultural lens as well. Now, this isn't me saying that theology is bad. In fact, Luther and the like have helped us think a great deal about God. And honestly, the lenses of our cultures are unavoidable. We're all shaped and influenced by them. I think in asking the first question, who do others say I am? Jesus asks us to consider how our cultures and theology shape how we see him. Jesus then turns to Peter and asks, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter names Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God, and Jesus praises him for his response. Jesus is not praising Peter's righteousness or strengths or perfect theology, but rather he's praising his testimony 
I wonder how often we try to make our declarations about God, declarations of perfect theology, or we try to assert our authority as the church through strengths or accomplishments instead of through testimony. You see, Peter didn't get it right because he had all the right answers. Clearly, remember the bread incident just a few verses before, or because he had the best theology. Wait until we get to what happens after this encounter next week. But rather, Peter got it right because he rested on his testimony of who he knew Jesus to be. And on this testimony, Jesus declares that this is the rock on which he'll build his church. Now, I know there's varying interpretations of who the rock is and what that means, but I want to put it out there that maybe the rock that Jesus was referring to wasn't Peter in and of himself, but his testimony. It's our testimony that builds the kingdom, not our right theology or our perfect lives or our convincing arguments, but our testimonies of transformation. My hope is that people wouldn't join our church because we got it all right or because we had the best or most perfect theology, but because of the power of our testimonies of how God has transformed us. And I'm not just talking about spiritually because Jesus was about whole self transformation. And that's the good news of the resurrection, right? The transformation and resurrection of our hearts, our souls, and our bodies. Nadia Boltz Weber, uh, the Lutheran pastor, says this about Peter and his confession. She says, the thing to remember is that it's not that Jesus had the guy it took to lead the church. It's that Peter had the God it took to lead the church, and that's different. For any leaders in the church, clergy or lay leaders, I hope we can hear this. It's not how great we are or how on point our theology is or how strategic our plans are, although those things are certainly important. It's not about having all the right stuff to lead the church. It's about having the God it takes to lead the church. Because the truth is, we're human. We're going to let people down. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to disappoint. We're not always going to be the best pastor or the best leader or the best Christian. It's not about those things. It's about having the God it takes to lead the church. This has been, honestly, a really hard lesson for me to learn. And church, it's not about having the best church with all the right programs and all the best people and all the right theology because the church is not built on those things. It's not. It's built on our testimonies of transformation and what those testimonies say about the invitation that Jesus has for everyone. Jesus' declaration that on this rock he will build his church might also be an allusion to Isaiah 51, which we also read today. And I find this so interesting because Isaiah 51 speaks to the rock of God's blessing of many descendants to Abraham. And it's interesting that Jesus might allude to this text in Isaiah because this text was written to God's people in exile. And its purpose was to comfort and assure them that God's promises would come to fruition despite how discouraging the circumstances might be. God would get the last word. I wonder if the disciples needed to be reminded of that before Jesus goes on to predict his death, which we will get to next week. The truth is, I doubt Peter even knew the full extent of his proclamation in that moment. It would probably take Jesus' death and resurrection for him to truly understand what he was saying. But God still had revealed himself to Peter in a way that was beyond mere knowing or textbook understanding. Because who do you say I am is not about answering a theological proposition, but about being in relationship with God. Which means that who God says, who we say God is, says something about who we are. 
about our own identity. Who we say God is says something about who we are. One theologian pointed out that of the innumerable miracles Jesus performed during his earthly ministry, perhaps none was greater than the miracle of inviting 12 poor, pigeonholed persons into community and empowering them to live into a new identity. And really, if Peter's called blessed for his testimony, then there is hope for all of us. Again, remember the bread incident. The Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor says that blessedness is less about perfectness and more about willingness. Blessedness is less about perfectness and more about willingness. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me. So after Peter's confession, Jesus says this kind of weird thing about binding and loosing. Verse 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what's that about? I've always struggled to understand this verse. What are the keys to heaven, and what are we binding and loosing? And all I see is a picture in my head of St. Peter standing at the pearly gates with a big thing of keys. Then I came across this really helpful explanation. The keys of the kingdom of heaven, which by the way, refers more to the kingdom here on earth than it does to the afterlife. Anyway, the keys of the kingdom of heaven are given to the church the same way a parent gives the keys to the family car to their teenager, risking that they might mess it up, but knowing it's the only way they'll actually learn. God had no expectations that Peter or the disciples, or us, would get it right all of the time. But he built the church on our testimonies anyway. So, cool fact about brains. I personally love learning about how our brains work. Scientists and psychologists are finding that when we make a mistake, synapses in our brains fire. A synapse is an electrical signal that moves between parts of the brain when learning occurs. So when we make mistakes, we learn and our brains grow in ways that they wouldn't if we had gotten it right the first time. So what this tells us is that making mistakes is good because they're opportunities for learning and growth. What an amazing God we have that he built mistakes as opportunities for learning and growth into our brains. God gives the church, the keys of the kingdom, not expecting perfection, but simply willingness. Peter was not perfect, far from it. And honestly, he was usually the first one to make a mistake, but he was always usually the first one to be willing too. I think about walking on water and how he was ready to just jump right out of that boat and he sank but he was willing to jump out of the boat. We see so many times where he kind of messes it up, but he's usually the first one to dive in and be ready to do something for Jesus. I'm so glad that our blessedness is more about willingness than perfection. Jesus asks us to be willing, willing to follow Jesus, willing to give testimony to who Jesus is, And as we'll see next week even, willing to make mistakes and learn. So, still, what is this binding and loosing business about? Binding and loosing is rabbinic terminology for doctrinal and disciplinary authority. Basically, it's the metaphor that rabbis like Jesus would use to talk about having the authority to teach theology and then to hold people accountable. Jesus is giving his followers the authority to interpret the kingdom of God to the world. Wait, but didn't we just talk about making mistakes? Yep. And doesn't that mean that true and loyal followers of Jesus are going to get it wrong sometimes? Yep. And God's okay with that? Yep. Blessedness is not about perfectness, but willingness. Willingness.
The authority to interpret the kingdom of God for the world is not based on the church's moral or intellectual superiority, thank God, but rather because Jesus has chosen to dwell among us. We weren't given the keys to the kingdom because we're somehow better than everyone else. We were given the keys to the kingdom because Jesus chose to dwell among us. It's about him, not about us. But it does mean that we've been given the responsibility and the task to be a part of making the kingdom of God visible to the world. New Testament scholar Mitchell Reddish says, Scripture is not static. It must be reapplied to new situations. Just as Jesus applies the teachings of the Torah in fresh and creative ways, the church must be emboldened to interpret the teachings of Jesus in new and inspired ways, attempting to be both faithful to the teachings of Jesus as found in Matthew's gospel and the rest of the New Testament, and be open to the voice of Jesus that speaks through the church to new situations and problems. Now, does this mean we change what scripture says? Obviously not, no. But if we're to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, if we're to really take those keys of the kingdom he's given us, we must be willing to see new applications and understandings of scripture as inspired by the Holy Spirit. This was the rabbinic tradition that Jesus was a part of. And rabbis actually continue to do this to this to this day. There's a whole collection of rabbinic teachings on scripture called the Tanakh. And it's similar to the commentaries we access today, although it holds probably a much higher authority than what we would consider the authority of our commentaries. But it's a reminder that we must rely on the word of God with the spirit of God as well to help us understand. I think the call to make the kingdom of God known to the world is not just about good sermons and Bible studies. In fact, that's the least of it, in my opinion. It's about our testimony and our testimony of both word and deed. The Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor says this. So the next time you bump into someone who asks you what you believe and all of a sudden you understand that your answer matters a great deal and that even though you do not know who is asking you the question, you know for sure whom you are answering. Well, go ahead and give it a try. You may say something stupid, but then again, you may surprise yourself and say something inspired instead. The important thing is to try, not only to say what we believe, but also to live what we believe, knowing that we are Peter's kin and that whether we rise or whether we fall, whether we give the right answer or the wrong one, we too are chips off the old block pieces of the one true rock against which even the very powers of death shall not prevail. Hmm. Who do we say Jesus is? And not just by repeating a creed, but with our lives, with our relationships, our time, our energy, our bank accounts, and all the rest. Here's the really good news I hope we can hear. It's not about getting it right all the time. It's about our willingness to continue to grow and to be formed by God in ways to make God's love, God's kingdom visible to the world. It's about being willing to share our testimony of transformation with the world because that is the rock on which Jesus is building his church. Listen. Us not always getting it right is actually probably one of the ways we make God's love visible to the world. Father Richard Rohr says that every time God forgives us, God is saying that God's own rules do not matter as much as the relationship that God wants to create with us. And it's through that relationship that we have a powerful testimony to share with the world. What do you think would draw people to Jesus more? Hearing about how God expects us to be perfect and live these perfectly moral and righteous lives all the time and never make mistakes and he's just sitting up there in heaven waiting for us to screw up so he can stare down at us and point his finger? Or to hear about a God 
that loves us so much that he's willing to build his entire kingdom on us knowing that means it's going to be messy, knowing it's going to be imperfect, at least for now. That's some really good news. That's good news. That's a powerful testimony that God builds his kingdom with us, warts and all. That God actually uses our mistakes as places of transformation rather than places of judgment. That is really good news. I love hearing testimonies of how God has transformed. Sometimes they're stories of physical healing. Sometimes they're stories of emotional or spiritual healing. For me, some of the most powerful testimonies I have heard have come from my friends who are incarcerated. The ways that Jesus has transformed them and is now transforming through them is a powerful witness. Friends, the church is growing inside prison in ways I can't even comprehend. So who is Jesus? Jesus is God's love for humans in flesh. God loved humanity so much that he did whatever was necessary to rescue us, even becoming human himself and creating a way back to wholeness and restoration for us and for the entire world. Jesus came to show us what's possible when God's love wins. And that is really good news. So let's share that with the world. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are a God of transformation. That you built your church on the power of Peter's testimony that you are the Messiah. That you are the son of the living God. God, would you continue that work with us? Would you bring transformation into our lives? And would you embolden us, God, to go out into the world and to share those testimonies of transformation with folks who are in desperate need of some good news? God, we thank you that you don't expect us to get it right all the time, but simply to be willing. We thank you that you build your church among us, as messy as that is. We thank you that you are a God who didn't abandon us, but instead did whatever it took to save us. God, would you continue that work among us today and this week? Would you show us places in need of your transformation, including those places inside of us? And would you give us the courage to declare that to the world? We pray all of this in the name of Jesus who makes all this possible. Amen.